Hello, everyone, and welcome to this webinar on the recently released guidance for the alternative care provision during COVID-19, coordinated by the Better Care Network, Save the Children, the Alliance for Child Protection in Humanitarian Action, and UNICEF. This session, designed for health policymakers, will introduce the guidance to and help policymakers understand their role in developing policies and guidance to prevent family separation during an outbreak. For more information on this webinar and future webinars, please visit Ready's website at www.ready-initiative.org. I'm now pleased to present the facilitators of this seminar. From Save the Children, Senior Humanitarian Child Protection Specialist, Lori Murray, and Senior Child Protection Advisor, Becky Smith. Thanks so much, Laura. And we can go on to the next slide. So thanks everyone for joining today. This is um, our second webinar of three. So we had one yesterday for uh, specifically aimed towards health practitioners. So what to do if you're working in a health facility and you have um, an unaccompanied or a separated child come or you need to discuss kind of care arrangements. Today, we're looking specifically at what are the key considerations for policymakers? And then next week, Tuesday, we are running the practitioners one again, but just um, at an earlier time for us based in London um, so that colleagues in Asia can also join us. Um, so thanks again for joining, and we can go on to the next slide. And can I ask um, for colleagues to please put in the chat box your name and organization and role? It'd be great for us to kind of get a bit of an idea of who, who is with us today. So what we're going to cover in this hour is we're going to give a brief introduction to the guidance, how it was created, who were the key actors involved, and what inspired this guidance. And then we're going to look at key considerations for policymakers. So this is looking at um, what do we need to take into account when preventing family separation? Uh, how can we promote family-based care? And then how do we work within um, residential care centers, including quarantine and isolation treatment centers? And this is um, pulled from the guidance. So the guidance is geared towards a variety of actors. Um, with specific sections and kind of considerations for health actors. And we can go to the next slide. Thank you. Great. So I'm just going to copy and paste the link to the guidance um, in case you're interested. I know that it was also on the invitation, but just so it's there. Um, the reason that we, all of these uh, agencies came together to write this guidance was because a lot of countries that had been working on alternative care and had been promoting uh, family preservation, had been working to strengthen families, were suddenly pulled into this other um, challenging area where the, they, they wanted on the one hand to stop the spread of the virus and protect the most vulnerable, but they also on the other hand wanted to keep children together. And so we wanted guidance that was geared towards this kind of what, how, how do you make those decisions and how do you as a policymaker or as a practitioner think through uh, ways in which that you can keep families together while keeping them safe as well. Um, this supports the initial technical note, which was written um, on the protection of children during COVID-19. Um, but we realized that we needed a little bit more of a how-to guidance rather than just sort of a more of an overview about considerations. Decades of research have shown that the family is the most protective environment for children, especially young children. Um, and like I said, a lot of government industries, NGOs and national coalitions were struggling as to how, how to do that in practice. Um, this covers humanitarian and development context. We, we know that COVID-19 has impacted all countries, uh, high income countries, middle income countries and low income countries. And so it starts with an understanding of the context and trying to understand what the laws and policies are that frame your work. Um, and then it also starts to go into making sure that, there, that you have the most appropriate care during COVID-19. Can you go to the next slide, please? 
So the guidance covers, um, we, we tried to consider all of the reasons why children may be uh, separated or need alternative care placements um, or need more additional support during COVID-19. So we considered children and families who may be facing challenges uh, because they've either been infected or are symptomatic or been exposed to COVID-19. We considered children who may need alternative care because their primary caregiver has been infected or is symptomatic or exposed and cannot continue to care for the child. And then we considered children who are already in alternative care. So when I'm talking about alternative care, I'm talking about care for a child outside of the biological family. We're also talking about children who are without family care, potentially migrant and displaced children, unaccompanied children, children detained at border crossings, and children living and working on the street. So this guidance goes into depth about as, as a policymaker, as a person working in the government, as a person working at, in an NGO, as a person working for the UN, what kinds of considerations will you need to take into account um, in trying to support families and keep them safe? Can I go to the next slide, please? So we're going to go, and we have a few questions for you. Um, if you can go to menti.com, uh, and uh, Lori has just put in the, the link there in the comment box, so you can click on it and type in the code 3890534, and you will see three questions, which we'll talk you through. So if you can just provide your answers. I don't think the code is working, so uh, I'd recommend to, to use the link oh, in the chat the box. Links. Yeah. Okay, sorry. So the first question is, I have seen national guidance for health workers on how to support unaccompanied children. And what we said last time and, and today is if you are supporting many different countries, if you try and, and choose a, a context or country to just to think about. Great. So a lot of I don't knows. Is there national guidance for health workers on how to support unaccompanied children? It's, it's not always clearly apparent, um, especially if you're not thinking about it. That's useful to know. Yep. And one person. <laughs> Who has great. Can we go to the next question? In my context, we have procedures and guidance for how to prevent family separation. Okay. Great. It's kind of a mix there. Not sure. It's nice to see there's, it is positive for some. No. Excellent. And, and the third question, I see myself as a key actor in promoting child protection. Hmm. Excellent. <laughs> Wonderful. That's exactly right. We're, uh, you know, I'm, I'm really pleased to see that because I think sometimes if you're not sure what, what the guidance is or what, what's out there, then you feel like a little bit uh, nervous about it. And this is exactly what we were trying to target is to say today, how as a healthcare professional can you support a child protection response, knowing that you're not an expert in it, but also knowing that you might have a role to play. So I'm really pleased to see that answer. Can you go to the next slide? Great. So there's a section before, you know, we get, we have a, a section at the beginning, which is considering how to prevent family separation. Um, next slide. One of the re things that we believe is that for a policymaker, 
you know, where are the laws and policies related to alternative care? And what are some examples? In most countries, in many countries, they will have uh, laws related to a, a child, a children's act, um, which has information about uh, the child and, and what happens if that child cannot be cared for in a biological family. So that might be an interesting uh, place to look. There are other um, countries in which uh, that are supported by sort of sub laws or bylaws to the, the Children's Act uh, with standards or guidance or supporting documentation. You might see in your country has national standards on alternative care. For example, Kenya has their own national standards on alternative care. You may see that there are national standards on childcare institutions or residential care. Um, but it's just interesting to know what already exists. And if you don't know, that's absolutely fine, but that's kind of why we really recommend that, you know, as part of your COVID-19 national task force, you would have someone from the Ministry of Social Affairs or the Ministry of Women and, and uh, Social Affairs, de depending on, on the language used, to help represent that so that there, are, if there are already standards or policies on what to do when a child is not with his or her biological family, that we're following those and that we're, we're strengthening those rather than trying to start something new. Um, and it's always easier to, to try and reinforce laws or policies that exist rather than starting from nothing. Um, and there may, may be, obviously with COVID-19, there are going to be additional considerations to put in place to ensure that alternative care placements continue to be safe during COVID-19, um, which health care providers and health uh, care experts can definitely contribute to. So it's something where child protection really needs to work together with, with health providers to make sure that the alternative care placements are safe. Some of the key points for these policies or standards, especially if you're, you're writing something new, is that all children require care regardless of whether or not they're unaccompanied or on the street, all children require some, someone who can safely care for him or her. Policies should be promoting keeping families together as safely as possible. We will talk about what happens if children need to be separated from her, his or her primary caregiver. And policies really need to, th to think about the practical support for caregivers to maintain contact with children that may need to separate. You know, sometimes the devil is in the details and whether or not it's a budget code for data or for mobile phones or for some other way for that, that caregivers and children can continue to communicate when they're separated can do a, a world of good. Promote child participation and, and ensure that both the child and caregiver can make informed decisions. We really are trying to push that there is not one right answer for all children in all scenarios, but it's about really giving the child and the caregiver the most accurate information possible uh, so that they can make informed decisions um, and not making those decisions for them. And so I think that that's also where we need to work much cl more closely together to make sure that, you know, information about COVID-19, about its spread, about preventing the spread of infection, dispelling rumors is something that, that um, child protection committees or groups really need information about so that we can work together. Um, and that consider what evidence can be gathered and what can be measured to ensure that the policies are working and the standards have been met. We know so many situations where the, we have the best laws and policies in the world, but they're not actually put into practice. So that's just something to consider when you are writing a standard operating procedure or you're, you're looking at laws and policies. Can you go to the next slide, please? Now, in child protection, we talk about something called gatekeeping. Um, and this is something that's a, a bit of a foreign word to a lot of uh, healthcare providers and professionals and probably some child welfare authorities as well. But it's this idea that there is a systematic procedure to ensure that alternative care for children is only used when necessary. And if that child needs alternative care, care outside of his or her family, that it's the most appropriate care for that individual child which basically means you need to have an assessment to make that decision. And that assessment should be made before a child is placed into care. 
without documentation, globally we see it's very easy for children to disappear, to become exploited, to be in situations that are not in their best interests. Um, and a national COVID-19 task force or a similar body that's working on infectious disease really needs to make sure that they have a, a mechanism to continue to function throughout this process, this crisis. If there is a gatekeeping mechanism that's in place, how is it going to continue to function if they can't meet in person? How are these decisions going to continue to be made? What happens when a child is placed somewhere outside of these gatekeeping mechanisms? What is the formal process and what is the informal process? Knowing that many relatives will make their own decisions and their own informal, um, you know, uh, decisions about who's going to care for this child if I can't. Um, emergency plans covering alternative care should be developed by child welfare authorities in partnership with service providers and community leaders, taking into account all of the, the changing uh, situations within the pandemic. And local authorities need to clarify who's responsible for what, uh, including caseworkers, community health workers, who does a referral to who, who makes these decisions, who's allowed to place a child somewhere, who's allowed to remove a child somewhere, um, and what happens, how do you record that so that there's a record of it. And then, uh, like I said, there's a re reporting mechanism. So service providers like healthcare providers can inform authorities about a child placed in residential care without formal gatekeeping decisions or a child that comes into a healthcare facility or a quarantine center. There is a record of where this child came from um, and how long they've been there. Next slide, please. So a lot of people will be involved in creating standard operating procedures. And what really needs to, to be part of this is preventing unnecessary placement into residential care. There's been decades of research showing the importance of family-based care for young children. Um, and so we need to make sure that a child is only placed in residential care if there's no other option. They, we also need to make sure that children who are coming out of residential care are going to a safe caregiver and there's someone following up with them. In the standard operating procedures, there should be something about what to do if a child has been exposed or has symptoms of the virus and requires isolation. One of the challenges with alternative care is that a lot of caregivers are older um, and may be susceptible to the virus. So how are we going to keep those children safe and how are we going, you know, is there testing available? What kind of quarantine could could happen? Is isolation possible within a household? These are all kinds of things that need to be considered depending on the situation. Um, it, it also requires, like I said, logistical support and trying to make sure that caregivers and children can continue to communicate with one another. Identifying key personnel and in, including caseworkers and essential resources uh, necessary for families to have their basic needs met. And as a healthcare provider, it's about making sure those links happen. So do you know the, the child protection workers in the area? Do the child protection workers know the community health workers? Do they know how to contact one another? Um, and how can they work more closely together? Um, and then messaging on preventing separation should also be shared so that people do understand that we are trying to keep families together. Um, and if a child must be separated from his or her primary caregiver, daily contact should be facilitated unless there's a, a significant risk to that child being in contact. Um, people wanted, had some questions about examples about what that might look like. So for example, let's say a mother in Cambodia has been exposed to COVID-19 and has been hospitalized. Her five-year-old daughter usually uh, looked after is usually looked after by her grandmother who has underlying health concerns. So we're a little bit worried because she might have been exposed by the mother. Can she stay with the grandmother or should she stay with someone else? The girl's mother decides that she should stay with her aunt. The community health worker ensures the aunt understands how to prevent the spread of COVID-19 and can take some measures to prevent the spread. Both the daughter and the aunt quarantine at home uh, with neighbors providing them food. And as long as the mother is well enough, even though she's hospitalized, she can still 
be given support to speak to the child on a regular basis until the two are reunited. So just to try and think through some of the logistical challenges, what we don't want to happen is when the mother comes out that she's not reunited with her child. We don't want the aunt to suddenly feel burdened or overwhelmed. We, we wanna make sure that she is supported as well. So those are just some of the kind of practical ways that you might support um, this. Next slide, please. Um, and also just some, some practical guidance that uh, all efforts should be made to prevent separation, like I've said. Social workers and caseworkers need to be classified as, as essential and providing provided with the appropriate PPE to keep them safe. Um, they will be looking at their caseload to decide who can they visit, uh, who do they need to visit in person, but also who can they talk to remotely and what other kinds of support the child and family might have. Child protection authorities need to determine which families and children should be seen in person versus remotely. And community health workers and social workers working with vulnerable families should try and discuss in a sensitive way if anything happens to you, who would you want to happen to, to take care of your child? And I know that this can be a bit challenging because you don't want to uh, insinuate that something bad is going to happen. But in the same way, what you're trying to do is to get caregivers to think of a plan so that you know their plan. Who would they want to care for their child? Who could care for their child if they couldn't? Um, and also start to think through if it sounds like separation is going to happen what is the guidance in place to keep the child in contact with his or her family during that period of isolation? Those are all things that can be included in standard operating procedures, which makes it much easier for those on the ground trying to implement to, to follow these directions, if that makes sense. Um, next slide, please. So I just wanted to the way we make decisions, it's all underpinned in the UN guidelines on the alternative care of children, which I'm just going to copy in here. It's in multiple languages. So if you're interested in learning more about it, you can, you can find it. Basically, there's two ways that we help to make decisions about alternative care placements for children. So this is kind of a simplified way of trying to understand what is the best placement for this child. So the first question practitioners should ask themselves is, is this alternative care placement necessary? Can the family be, you know, provide care for a child if they are supported? And if so, they should be supported to do so. Can the, ch the family care, care for that child in a safe way? And what special considerations might be needed because of COVID-19? And then, if the child still needs alternative care, it is necessary. It's this question called suitability. What is the most suitable placement for the child based on his or her individual needs? And that again requires an individual assessment. What does the child prefer? What does the family prefer? Who are the family members nearby? Who is able to care for that child? Who does the child have a strong connection with? These questions should be asked in both formal and informal placements. And as policymakers, you wouldn't be asking them yourselves, but what you should be prompting people to do in your own guidance is to make sure that social workers and healthcare workers are asking these kinds of questions before a child is, is removed from a family or placed somewhere else. Healthcare staff need to know how to report an unaccompanied child brought to their facility. It happens all the time. And usually we wait until a child is there and suddenly we don't know what to do. So it's about trying to put a policy in place so that healthcare workers know exactly who to contact and how they're going to follow up. It might be local child protection workers. It might be local government. There's a policy in place. Remember that families often make their own arrangements and should be encouraged to do so, but if at all possible, encourage healthcare workers, community health workers to document that so that there is some kind of record of where that child has gone and why. Um, again, it just holds some accountability. We're not trying to formalize a completely informal system, but we recognize that there are risks to children and there needs to be some way of trying to follow what's happening to children. Next slide, please. 
So again, how do we promote family-based care during a pandemic? Um, next slide, please. Ensure there are systems in place for community health workers to alert child protection practitioners of any families where children may be currently unsafe or any families that have been separated due to the pandemic or at risk of separation. Again, community health workers will know if there's extremely vulnerable families, uh, people in a household or the type of makeup of the household, but they might not share that uh, information with the social workers or the community child protection groups. Ensure that systems are in place for caregivers visited by community health workers to know to who to contact if they have concerns and if there's available supports like cash assistance, livelihoods, parenting, caregiver support and health services. And ensure that child protection workers have up-to-date knowledge about COVID-19. Oftentimes we're trying to say give parents, caregivers, and, you know, family members, children, accurate information um, so that they can make an informed choice, but they don't always have the most up-to-date um, health information, which is why we need to collaborate. Next slide, please. Um, and just to quickly go through some of the, the alternative care options that we often use, kinship care, which is the most commonly used uh, form of care, which is your extended family. And that's what is practiced all over the world. Um, and foster care, which is family-based care provided to the child by someone outside of the extended family, both of which are, are well, foster care is usually short term. Always consider family-based care arrangements before uh, foster care, I mean, before residential care, sorry. Um, and have a plan for the child to be reunited with his or her primary caregivers as soon as it's safe. Um, and possible. And then support caregivers in reducing the risk of transmission through providing PPE, daily supplies, and discussing ways for isolation if at all possible. Caregivers and children should know how to access support and report any concerns and make sure that children and caregivers know if a child has underlying conditions that may put him or her at risk. And I know that this continues to evolve as, as we learn more and more about COVID-19, but it's just trying to make sure again that they have accurate information. The, the role of the healthcare workers in this process is to make sure they know the community groups and the child protection workers in the areas and can make referrals if necessary. Next slide, please. Logistical support. We, we touched on this before, but again, it's the devil is in the details. How, if a child needs to go to a different placement, how are they going to be transported safely without infecting others, without being infected themselves? How are they going to be able to follow up with, with their caregivers um, through phone credit or devices? Um, and how are they going to have, is it possible to provide free or immediate medical screening or testing for children who have been exposed prior to placement in a family? If that helps to keep the family together, but also um, takes away some of that stigma, is that available and possible? Encourage local community groups and local officials to set up a system to check on vulnerable families, especially if they need to quarantine at home. This is definitely a, a general, you know, a health activity and it can also be a child protection activity as well. Um, and I will move on to, to Lori to talk a little bit more about residential care, quarantine centers and isolation treatment centers. Thanks. Great, thanks Becky. So as Becky mentioned, our goal is to keep children in their families um, as much as it's safe and feasible to do so. So the, we've included a section on residential care here, which incorporates quite a wide variety of uh, facilities. So residential care can be an orphanage, but it could also potentially be a quarantine center um, or isolation treatment centers. Uh, in child protection, we have interim care centers as well, which provides kind of short term care to children who need a place to stay while we maybe they're lost children and we're trying to find their families or maybe it's an urgent protection case. So we saw during kind of the, the onset of COVID-19, we saw uh, a lot of different responses to residential care facilities. So here I'm talking more about 
orphanages or maybe um, academic institutions that have children stay over, etc. So some governments and local authorities ordered the closure of residential care facilities and sent children back to their families. Um, and so in some cases, this happened almost overnight. Um, and we know that in, in many contexts uh, that have children in residential care, they actually do have family and parents who are willing to care for them, but might face significant challenges to care for them. And that's why they've put them in residential care. So maybe it's due to poverty and they think that the children will have better care in an orphanage or um, a boarding school or, or some sort of equivalent. Um, or maybe they have lack, a lack of access to social services and support. So what we recommend is that where it's safe to do so and it's in the best interest of the child, that we um, support them in returning home. Um, and I think it's really important that this is not just kind of a one size fits all, but instead that uh, we're looking at each individual child's needs. We might find that in some cases it's not appropriate for children to, to go home. Um, and it might be that children return home and their family and community actually haven't had adequate time to prepare or um, don't really have the the resources necessary to support their children. And then there might be actually a greater risk to children such as stigmatization or violence, or abuse, neglect, et cetera. So this is again, why we don't go for kind of a one size um, fits all approach. Um, so that was some cases we saw this. So we saw that the residential care facilities closing. Um, in other cases, we saw residential care facilities going into lockdown. So this could be that the facilities uh, determined that they were going to not let children or in some cases staff outside of the facilities during COVID. Uh, so this I think was done kind of in an effort of containment, but uh, potentially posed a risk to children um, who maybe would have had visits from their family or maybe were able to uh, have plans to go back. Um, it also poses kind of greater questions for the staff as well, who might have care responsibilities of their own. Um, in these types of cases, we're particularly concerned about children's safety and well-being, um, and, and we're looking to have kind of policymakers take steps to ensure um, children's rights are kind of upheld and that children still have access to essential services. We also need to make sure that children still have access um, and communication links with their family. Um, and, and it's really critical that if these, if these facilities are locked down, that children have ways of reporting um, abuse or concerns within the facilities because the monitoring then and kind of external people coming out or communication might be limited. For children who remain in residential care during the pandemic, emergency planning is really critical to ensure that they're safe and that the facility is in a position to provide quality care. Um, and we look a lot at kind of the quality of the care, not just the fact that the children have somewhere to go, but are they accessing services? Are they having their basic needs met? Are they able to uh, maintain contact with a family member? Are we keeping sibling groups together, et cetera? So as kind of said before, and, and we'll stress a few times, I'm sure, is that we wanna make sure that um, children have individual care plans, that we're looking at each child's individual situation and that we're able to uh, respond to that. And we want to ensure that um, there are policies in place that allow us to continue to access these children and, and to monitor the kind of quality of care within these facilities. Next slide, please. So residential care really is uh, kind of in all circumstances, a last resort option for us. Um, and this is for kind of the protection issues that we've highlighted, but it's also more prone to cluster infection. Um, and so potentially higher public health risk as well for children. Um, we know, and we have a lot of research that shows us that children in residential care are at higher risk of abuse, neglect and exploitation. And this is especially true for more marginalized or vulnerable groups such as children with disabilities. So we encourage um, policies and authorities to ensure that there are linkages between health facilities and residential care facilities such as orphanages 
to ensure that there's still access to healthcare and to make sure that those relationships are strong, potentially having a nurse in the facility or having really clear referrals between uh, the facility and um, the healthcare centre. And then as we said, no matter what kind of facility we have, we want to ensure and support that the caregiver is able to see or visit or communicate with their child. And sometimes the barriers to this are something as simple as, as what Becky was mentioning, is that you don't have a budget line for phone credit um, or a system for children to be able to call, call their families. Um, I should add that this entire section on residential care um, is complementary to the WHO's considerations for quarantine of individuals in the context of containment for coronavirus. So that serves as our overarching guidance, and then this is kind of sub-guidance to be considered um, when we're looking at kind of child rights and child protection. Next slide, please. Right. So we, in the guidance, we've developed key actions um, for policymakers to take uh, to promote child protection. So in the terms of emergency preparedness and residential care, we've, we've really highlighted the need for emergency plans in place. If kind of uh, the country goes into lockdown or if there's these various containment measures, um, having emergency plans in place for those children in residential facilities, um, how will they access services? How will they still be able to communicate with their families? And how will we ensure that we're not just closing doors um, and not seeing those children for months? Um, we recommend to rapidly map and assess available facilities. So we saw this happening in some contexts. Um, and in other contexts, we saw um, officials using abandoned schools or schools that weren't operational for children and kind of gathering children that were living on the street and putting them in these centers. But if we're able to already have a map of existing facilities and we know which ones are high quality and which ones need support, then this helps kind of enable our ability to respond. We want to ensure that we're registering children that are coming in. So having a temporary register to assist with identification and inclusion of unregistered facilities. So if facilities are starting to pop up, which we see in uh, all humanitarian contexts, um, we want to make sure that we're actually recording them, because if we don't know a facility is, is housing children, then we can't necessarily provide support. Um, and we want to have really clear directives for children who are able to return to their families and the process for children returning to their families. Like I said, in some contexts, we saw facilities closed down and they said, make your way home, um, which posed quite a lot of child protection risks to children who were kind of navigating um, how to get home with various closures and lockdowns. And um, we wanna ensure that there's agreement with the public health ministries and sectors to ensure oversight over nutrition and health services, including health education. So um, I think child protection actors are often able to kind of make messages child-friendly, but ensuring that the information is accurate and that we're kind of following the national guidance. Um, as Becky mentioned, kind of we need to ensure that staff are classified as essential and then that they get the necessary PPE to, to do their jobs. So we need to make sure that social workers are able to continue doing their work and residential care staff are able to continue providing care for children in the safest way possible. And there are specific considerations and support we need to take into account for children with disabilities or those with underlying health issues. And all of these issues and kind of topics can be covered in standard operating procedures, which um, we've talked about and we'll, we'll do a bit of practice on. Next slide, please. So in terms of regulating the use of residential care, like we said, we don't want to see kind of an influx of children to residential care. As much as possible, we want to keep them within their families. So we recommend that governments and authorities issue a moratorium on the establishment of new residential care facilities. So not only that there's a threshold for quality, but actually that we shouldn't be developing these new facilities and we should be relying on what already exists. We also want to make sure that we're establishing or strengthening family-based care systems to avoid placing infants and young children in residential care. Um, there are really detrimental impacts for, for young children being in residential care. And so if we have kind of standby foster families um, or we've looked to kind of strengthen uh, or look at high risk separations, 
we're able to support those families to identify um, another family that can care for their child in the event of, of them having to be potentially hospitalized or uh, not being able to care for their child. And then we want to ensure appropriate and safe care inside the residential facilities themselves. So uh, we want to ensure that there's minimum standards and ratios. We've got really clear guidance um, and references in this guidance document to how many children, by what age, to how many staff members. Um, but of course, it's not enough to have our minimum standards. We need to make sure we've got that monitoring. Are we actually meeting those minimum standards or are they just kind of a, a poster on the wall? We want to ensure that staff have access to PPE and that they have training on infection prevention and control. Um, and that this is done in kind of an accessible way um, to residential care staff. And only permitted staff should enter and we should have really clear safeguarding procedures in place. So we'd want to see kind of policies and procedures around who is and isn't permitted to go into these centers, what's the purpose of them going into the centers and how is that going to benefit children? Um, and this is to avoid also potentially um, people taking kind of the opportunity of reduced regulations, reduced monitoring to exploit children, to take children that are not their own, et cetera. There need to be agreed referral pathways with health authorities um, and multiple safe and child-friendly methods of reporting. So if there's a confidential phone that children can use, but there's also someone who comes in to, to do the monitoring, et cetera. So it's looking at a variety of ways or even the non anonymous feedback box they're having a variety of options for children to, to report any concerns that they're having. Next slide, please. And the other webinar we've done, we went into a lot of detail about this because it's really geared towards health practitioners. But in the guidance document, we have tables that detail a scenario and what we recommend to do in that scenario or key actions we would want to see taken. So in quarantine centers, we have guidance for unaccompanied children who are placed in the quarantine centers if a child comes alone or with a stranger to a quarantine center. What to do if a family is placed in a quarantine center together, this is kind of our lowest risk um, scenario, should I say. And what to do if a member of the family is placed in a quarantine center. So for example, what to do if a mother goes into a quarantine center and there's worry or concern about the children she's um, left at home. And then we've looked at isolation treatment centers and various scenarios and how to respond to those. So isolation treatment centers, I know they have different terminology, but this is kind of a higher level of um, medical care. And this is what to do if an unaccompanied child enters the facility, what to do if a caregiver brings the child to the facility and they're not able to stay with the child, um, or they would like a cousin or an aunt to go and accompany the child. And then really tragically, what to do if the child's primary caregiver dies in a health facility. And we've included some really practical scripts of what to discuss and what to talk through in these different scenarios. And with that, I'll hand over to Becky. All right, so now we're going to try <laughs> and uh, have you practice a little bit. Um, so if you go to the, um, let's see, I'll just put it back in the, if you go to the mentee uh, again, the first question you'll see is you're going to be a, a national COVID task force. So you are part of a national COVID task force. You're developing a guidance note on responding to the needs of children in quarantine centers. What do you think should be included in this guidance? So any words that you think or, or areas that you think should be part of that guidance? And don't worry, there's, there's not just a one and right answer. It's just to get you to think about what would you put in place on responding to the needs of these children. Yeah, some safeguarding considerations, gender considerations, gatekeeping, excellent, glad to see. So some kind of assessment, what are you going to do before they're placed in quarantine and where did they come from? 
What else? Yeah. PPV, is that, do they have appropriate information? And I would add to that appropriate information being child friendly for children. I think the other thing that's not always clear is whether or not children are are able to stay with family members in quarantine. Are they with other adults that they don't know? How are you going to make sure that the children have are able to stay with their own family members and then what to do if they're alone? First aid, yep. Protection, good. General, <laughs> good. Some social services as well, yep. Are you going to have somebody who's able to talk with them and trying to figure out what's what's happening? What else? Training, yeah. Can you add any more about what kind of training you think staff should have? Anything a bit more specific? Okay, great. Well, th that's just the beginning of the types of things. Yeah, disability inclusive, great. Um, it just just to think through what would happen, what specific needs do children have when they are entering a quarantine uh, center? What does it look like in your context? How do you keep children safe? How do you keep children protected from adults they don't know, protected from other children? The referrals, yep. And a strong referral mechanism and making sure that they do actually need to be there and that they can't quarantine at home. Great. Uh, shall we go on to the next question now that you're starting to think this through? What principles would you follow from the guidelines for the alternative care of children and making decisions about the placement of children? What are some of the principles that you would think about? Yeah, do no harm. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, the best interest of the child. What is the best interest of the child? And remember that that could be different for different children. What did I talk about earlier in the presentation as well about making decisions about placement? So the other two things you may want to consider is, is this idea of necessity. Does the child need to be here? Can he be supported in his or her family? And then if they do need to be there, what is the most appropriate place for this child based on their age? Yep. Information. PPE available. Are they separated from their families? Perfect. Those are all things to consider. And how are you going to help practitioners make those decisions and document why they made those decisions, why that child's there, where did he come from, and how, where is he going next? Perfect. Um, next slide, please. What would you need to provide funding for to facilitate children and families staying in contact with one another? So just think about your context. Think about a child who has to be hospitalized or separated from his or her family. How would you, what kinds of support would they need to be able to contact their family, if any? Okay, yeah, they might need a private space where they could speak. They might need transport costs if they were actually going to, to visit their family, if that was safe to do so. Or being placed back with a family, how are they going to be able to go if they can't go on public transport? Recharge card, perfect. Phone credit, absolutely. Food supply, PPE, yep. Perfect. Yeah, that's exactly what we were thinking about is just sometimes 
you you say you want to keep them in contact but if there is no budget line for something like phone credit which can be a really small budget line um, it can make a big difference so that was what we wanted you to think about there all right great um, and then uh, so if we can end our Mentimeter and go back to the presentation we just wanted to open it up for a few minutes. We only have a few minutes left, but just if you have questions for us or anything that you would like to, to ask us more about before we end. And just to, to make it faster, if you can just type any of the questions that you have in the, in the text box or in the chat box. And we can respond. So currently the, the guidelines, uh, the guidance document is in English, but it's also being translated into French and Arabic. Um, I can see many of you are, are working in countries where Arabic is spoken. So hopefully we can share that with you when it's finalized. Does anyone have any questions for us today? We've also left, um, Lori's email address in case anything comes up or you have a question as you're uh, as you're working in the field. I don't see any questions. Okay. Maybe I just pass it back over to you, Laura. But do feel free at any point to type in questions. Thanks. Thanks so much, Becky. And with that, I'm happy to conclude this webinar on the guidance for alternative care provision during COVID-19. Special thank you to our two presenters, Lori Murray and Becky Smith, and to the Ready Initiative and the Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance for hosting today's session. Thank you to all of our participants for joining. We will be sending out a recording of the webinar in the next few days. If there's any outstanding questions, feel free to contact uh, the Ready Initiative, or you can see the contact information for Lori Murray on the screen. With that, I will close today's session and thank you all so much for joining. Thank you.